Good morning and Namaskar ladies and gentlemen. It gives me extreme pleasure standing here interacting with you on a CME that is solely dedicated to radiology and ENT. It really wouldn't be presumptuous on my part if I assumed that this is possibly one of the first of its kind and I do sincerely hope not the last. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwar, Guru Sakshat Par Brahma, Tashmai Shri Guru Devo. Well, in my journey so far, I've been blessed and fortunate enough to have come across a large number of well-meaning friends and teachers. But the one person who's left an indelible stamp on my psyche, on my thought, and who has taught me more than I could have ever imagined, is Professor Mario Sana of Rupo Tarani. And whatever gratitude I expressed towards him would always fall short. Now, I have been asked to interact with you on HRCT of the temporal bone from a surgeon's perspective. Whether you are a surgeon, a radiologist, or any other clinician, it's extremely important for you that in order to understand the radiology of any particular area, you know the anatomy of that area inside out. It's only once that you master the anatomy of the concerned area that you're able to understand what the anatomical alterations are, and hence, what is the probable pathology that is responsible for bringing about that alteration. So, the entire presentation would possibly be divided into these three sections wherein we would discuss a little bit of normal anatomy, a little bit of the anatomical alterations and then of the probable pathologies. Mind you, this is not a didactic lecture wherein I would sort of speak down upon to you and teach you the anatomy of the temporal bone. It's a vast subject. It is just to give you a little food for thought, generate an interest so that you can go back home and possibly follow this as a passion. So, moving on to the normal anatomy. Professor Andre Sultan of France says that there are three ways to learn the anatomy, especially of an, of the, uh, of an area as complex as the temporal bone. And those three ways are temporal bone dissection lab, temporal bone dissection lab, and once again, temporal bone dissection lab. The more time that you spend in the temporal bone dissection lab, the more you become aware of the interpersonal play, if I may use the term instead of relationship, the interpersonal play between these important structures that fortunately or unfortunately for an ear surgeon, God decided to house within the petrous temporal bone. I again would not be presumptuous if I say that if we take a per square inch or per square centimeter density, I think temporal bone is possibly the only part of the human body which is densest as far as critical organs are concerned. Now, moving on to certain basic considerations. Like any other scan, like any other CT or for that matter, any other scan, the CT temporal is usually read on two sections. One, the axial, and the other is the coronal. And the pivot here is the orbitometal line. While the coronal sections are perpendicular to the orbitometal line, the axial section is parallel to it, and that is something we should always remember. We do obviously have these days with the advancement of technology, the advancement of digital technology, we again have the oblique sagittal scans, but in my opinion, they have a pretty limited role. There are certain tips that I would put, front in, uh, put for, uh, forth in, uh, in front of you, tips that you could take back home, and I do hope that they would help you sort of interpret CT scans much better, especially of the temporal bone. First, always try and read scans in a sequence. Picking up scan number five and trying Check. to read the anatomy Check. of the temporal bone out of context with the previous and the subsequent scan can always land you in trouble. I mean, it could land you in trouble once in a while. So it's always preferred that you read the scans in a sequential fashion. Say, for example, if, if it be the actual scans, you can always read them in a superior to inferior manner. And if it's a coronal scan, you could go about interpreting them in an anterior to posterior or posterior to anterior fashion. My personal opinion, as far as actual cuts are concerned, try doing it superior to inferior because, again, the density of the vital structures is least in the superior cuts and it sort of increases as you go down. So as you become familiar with the anatomy of the patient as far as his or her temporal bone is concerned, it becomes easier to identify structures. As far as coronal scans are concerned, try doing it posterior to anterior for a similar reason. Next. Any structure that is parallel to the section would appear in its entirety or as a tubular structure, 
whereas any structure that is perpendicular to the scan, to the axis of the scan, would appear circular. Now let me make this point a little more clear with you with some examples. The horizontal internal carotid artery, as we all know, is housed in the petrous temporal bone, right? Now, the horizontal temporal, uh, internal carotid artery is parallel to the actual scan. And hence, on the left-sided sc scan, you see the entire horizontal internal carotid artery. Whereas the same horizontal internal carotid artery on the right side, that is on the coronal section, appears circular because it is moving perpendicular to the axis of the scan. Or for that matter, if we take the vertical part of the facial nerve, the mastoid segment, now the vertical part of the facial nerve is parallel to the coronal sections and hence appears in its entirety in the left scan, whereas the same structure becomes circular when you move on to an actual scan. Identifying the ossicles at times can be a little bit of a problem, but if you follow a very, very, especially on coronal sections, but if you follow a very simple philosophy, there are chances that your margin of error would reduce. Now, there are two main structures that we tend to get confused with, and that is the body of the incus and the head of the malleus, right? When they're housed in the epitympanic area or the attic area. Draw an axis along the, uh, draw a longitudinal axis along the ossicle, and what you would find is that the long axis of the body of the incus is obliquely oriented in a coronal section, whereas the long axis of the head of the malleus is longitudinally or vertically oriented. The malleus would never be obliquely oriented in a coronal section unless you've positioned your patient improperly. If you see a bilobed structure, it's neither the incus nor the malleus. It's a combination of the two, and that is the incudomaleolar joint, which you see there. The bilobed structure, the posterior superior part, is formed by the body of the incus, whereas the anterior inferior part is being formed by the head of the malleus. Moving on to the actual scans, as far as the ossicle is concerned, most of the radiologists are aware of this term called the ice cream cone appearance of the incudomaleolar joint in the attic. While the circular, anterior circular shadow is formed by the head of the malleus, it's basically a bird's eye view. In fact, all actual scans are bird's eye view. You're sort of looking down upon the body or looking up along the body. So the anterior circular shadow is being formed by the body of the, uh, the head of the malleus, whereas the posterior triangular conical appearance is because of the body and the short process of the incus. Again, the classical uh, appearance on an oblique scan, that's an oblique sagittal scan, and uh, this is called the molar tooth configuration of the incudomaleolar joint. The anterior shadow that you see is the head of the malleus and the uh, handle of the malleus, whereas the posterior shadow, or the shadow on the right that you see is the body, the short process, and in the, the long process of the incus. So it's like a double root molar tooth, and this is called the classical molar tooth configuration of the incudomaleolar joint on an oblique sagittal scan. As far as otologists are concerned, we are especially bothered about the sinus tympani. How deep is the sinus tympani? Whether the facial nerve, or rather whether the pathology is extending into the, uh, into the sinus tympani. And since the facial nerve forms an important border of the sinus tympani, how much of a bone can I drill over the facial nerve before I can really identify or reach the depths of the sinus tympani? And that is better visualized on an actual scan. The yellow arrow that you see is the facial recess. I prefer to call this the sleeping W sign. So it's a sleeping W sign. Now, the two Vs that form the W, the lateral part, so it's, it's kind of a sleeping W if you see properly. This, the vertical limb, that's the, uh, the pyramid, and that's the uh, other vertical limb of the W. So this is the bony annulus, the tympanic, uh, bony tympanic annulus. That's the vertical segment of the uh, facial nerve, and that's the sinus tympani, whereas this is the facial recess. So this another is another area which an otologist or a radiologist would be concerned about, because if you have a sinus tympani, which can be the case in a, I mean, which can be the scenario in a large number of cases, if the sinus tympani is a pretty deeply extending sinus tympani, remember there's only a certain amount of bone that you can remove. And hence, you might have to figure out a different way of approaching a patient who has a cholesteatoma extending deeper into the sinus tympani. That was a little bit about uh, the anatomy. Obviously, we cannot cover the entire anatomy. I haven't spoken to you about the inner ear and so on and so forth. But now let's quickly take a look at a little bit of anatomical alterations that we could encounter in our day-to-day -day practice. 
Right now, we had seen the classical ice cream cone appearance of the incudomelular joint as the normal anatomy in the attic area. Now, what we can see is the incus and the melis, they seem to be intact, but then the, sim the, the, the symbiosis or the joint between them is missing. And as we can see, there is a little bit of soft tissue which is uh, present on the lateral aspect of the epitympanic or the attic area. So that is one sign that you have wherein you have the sort of disruption of the ice cream cone appearance of the incudomelular joint. And uh, that should uh, uh, give an inkling to the radiologist or to the otologist as to whether an ossicular plasty or any kind of an ossicular uh, reconstruction would be required in this particular patient. The tegmen. Now, the tegment is, tegment is the bony plate, whether it be the tegment antri or the tegment tympani. The tegment is the bony plate which forms the roof of the mastoid bone. When it is over the antrum, we call it the tegment antri, and when it's over the middle ear or the attic area, rather, it's called the tegment tympani. Now, an important complication, as we all know, of cholesteatoma, uh, of the pathology of cholesteatoma, is intracranial complication. And one very important finding, as far as CT scan is concerned, is the erosion. As you can see over here, the tegment is intact. That the, that's the head of the malleus. That's the scutum. Those are the turns of the cochlea and the parts of the facial nerve. But very clearly, you see in a comparative picture that the tegment is totally missing. And there's a soft tissue which not only extends into the attic area, but probably is in close contact with the middle cranial fossa. Again, the sinus plate, the sigmoid sinus lies or the lateral sinus is right behind the sig uh, sinus plate in the uh, p uh, petrous part of, or the mastoid part of the temporal bone. And any break in this particular bone over on the sinus area, that's the sinus plate area, and any break in this particular area should always, should always warn the radiologist and the otologist about the probability of having an intracranial complication either in the form of a lateral sinus thrombosis or a perisinus abscess or for that matter even a cerebellar abscess. That's the MRI which confirms the fact, that's the pathology which is seen in the middle area and middle ear and the mastoid area. And that is the hyperintense signal that you see within the sigmoid sinus, which suggests that there is a sigmoid sinus or rather a lateral sinus thrombosis. Now, patient presents with dizziness. Clinically, you are quite sure that there is cholesteatoma. But then if the patient has dizziness, you need to know what the reason behind that dizziness is. And as far as the ear is concerned, the first thought that comes to our mind as far as cholesteatoma is concerned is whether the patient is harboring any fistula or not. Now again, going back to the actual view, normal scan, the incudomelular joint and a classical ice cream cone appearance. And that's the dense compact bone over the lateral semicircular canal. That is the lateral semicircular canal. And the white bone that you see is the dense ivory compact bone over the lateral semicircular canal. Now. If you see a dimpling over the bone, over the lateral semicircular canal, your antennae should get raised. Whether it be valvasori, whether it be Schwartz, whether it be Somme and Curtin, dimpling over the bone that covers or rather houses the labyrinth, please, please, please be very, very careful as to whether you are dealing with a lateral sinus, a lateral uh, semicircular canal uh, fistula, which is much clearer now. Now that is a frank fistula of the lateral semicircular canal. Again, if you do a comparative uh, study, you find that the dense ivory bone over here is intact, whereas there is a through and through erosion of the bone over the lateral semicircular canal. Now again, according to Somen Curtin and Valvasori, if you find if you find a fistulous communication uh, between the pathology and the semicircular canal on one cut, the chances are that there is a probable fistula. If you find it on two consecutive cuts, the probability increases. But if you find it on three subsequent, uh, I mean, con consecutive cuts, you can be rest assured that there is a fistulous communication between the pathology and the semicircular canal. So it is extremely important that HRCTs of temporal bone are true HRCTs and not just for the sake of doing HRCTs, you know. True HRCTs are meant to be one millimeter cuts. If you have a five millimeter cut in the name of an HRCT, your lateral semicircular canal is over and done with. You can never ever appreciate the fact that you have a fistulous communication on three consecutive scans. So that is something you have to be very, very particular about.